wicked All these slave masters posing on your dollar With the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the pending appointment of Amy Barrett, the issue of abortion has become a hot topic once again. With many on the right declaring that Roe v. Wade would be overturned, and many on the left worried about losing women's body autonomy, I thought it would be a good idea to visit this topic. While I do feel some of the left's fears are valid, I think overturning Roe v. Wade will be a huge feat for several reasons. However, let's begin by taking a look at what Roe v. Wade means. Part 1. Roe v. Wade According to HistoryChannel.com, up until the 19th century, abortion was legal to the point of quickening, or when a woman could feel the first movements of the child. During the 1820s and 30s, some of the first regulations surrounding abortions began popping up, but they were focused on the drugs women used to induce abortions. Around the 1850s, a new medical organization was created called the American Medical Association. It was a group of doctors that wanted to regulate abortions to deter competition with housewives and homeopaths. Couple that with nativists who were concerned about the growing number of immigrants in the country and the decreased number of white American-born Protestant women given birth, I've heard this before, like the number of black people who get abortions. A movement began to grow to criminalize abortion. In 1869, the Catholic Church banned abortion at any stage of pregnancy, and by the 1880s, abortion was pretty much outlawed nationally. Abortion was originally legislated by the profit motives of doctors and the worry of immigrants taking over the country. Then comes the decision of Roe v. Wade. On January 22, 1973, the Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, struck down the Texas law banning abortion, effectively legalizing the procedure nationwide. In a majority opinion written by Justice Harry Blackmun, the court declared that a woman's right to an abortion was implicit in the right to privacy protected by the 14th Amendment. The court divided pregnancy into three trimesters and declared that the choice to end a pregnancy in the first trimester was solely up to the woman. In the second trimester, the government could regulate abortion, although not ban it, in order to protect the mother's health. In the third trimester, the state could prohibit abortion to protect a fetus that could survive on its own outside the womb, except when a woman's health was in danger. The portion of the 14th Amendment that was used was Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The court said, The right of privacy founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. However, a lot of these provisions were later overturned in the case of Planned Parenthood v. Casey. The primary holding of the court was, a person retains the right to have an abortion, established by Roe v. Wade, but the state's compelling interest in protecting the life of an unborn child means that it can ban an abortion of a viable fetus under any circumstances except when the health of the mother is at risk. Also, laws restricting abortion should be evaluated under an undue burden standard rather than a strict scrutiny analysis. Some things of interest from the opinions of the court are a. To protect the central right recognized by Roe while at the same time accommodating the state's profound interest in potential life, the undue burden standard should be employed. An undue burden exists, and therefore a provision of law if it is invalid. If its purpose or effect is to place substantial obstacles in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus obtains viability. B. To promote the state's interest in potential life throughout pregnancy, the state may take measures to ensure that the woman's choice is informed. Measures designed to advance this interest should not be invalidated if their purpose is to persuade the woman to choose childbirth over abortion. 
These measures must not be an undue burden on the right. C. As with any medical procedure, the state may enact regulations to further the health or safety of a woman seeking an abortion, but may not impose unnecessary health regulations that present a substantial obstacle to a woman seeking an abortion. D. Adoption of the undue burden standard does not disturb Roe's holding that regardless of whether exceptions are made for particular circumstances, a state may not prohibit any woman from making the ultimate decision to terminate her pregnancy before viability. E. Roe's holding that subsequent to viability, the state in promoting its interest in the potentiality of human life may, if it chooses, regulate and even proscribe abortion except where it is necessary, an appropriate medical judgment for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. And also, their opinion on abortion being a fundamental right. 2. The Roe Court reached too far when it analogized the right to abort a fetus to the rights involved in Pierce v. Society of Sisters, Mayer v. Nebraska, Loving v. Virginia, and Griswold v. Connecticut and thereby deem the right to an abortion to be fundamental. None of these decisions endorsed an all-incumbency right of privacy, as Roe, Supra, claimed. Because abortion involves the purposeful termination of potential life, the abortion decision must be recognized as sui generis, different in kind from the rights protected in earlier cases under the rubric of personal or family privacy and autonomy and the historical traditions of the American people, as evidenced by English common law and by the American abortion statutes in existence both at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption and Roe's issuance, do not support the view that the right to terminate one's pregnancy is fundamental. Thus, enact enactments abridging that right need to be subjected to strict scrutiny. This case was a descendant of the Roe v. Wade line of decisions but it replaced the trimester framework with a focus on viability and determining when the state's interest could outweigh the interest of a pregnant woman. The addition of the undue burden standard tilted the balance in the state's favor when making these determinations. However, since the Supreme Court was so deeply divided, the door remained open to future challenges to Roe. Part 2. What does that even mean? Roe v. Wade decided that women had the right to an abortion through an interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Basically, it's a privacy issue. That the state does not have any business regulating abortion except in the ways described in its decision based upon trimesters. Planned Parenthood v. Casey threw out the trimester guidelines and concluded the right to abort a fetus is not fundamental. It sets up the conversation about viability. Notice that the actual moral or ethical question about abortion was never tackled. Neither case makes no claim that abortion is right nor wrong. It simply sidesteps that question through legal structures. I don't believe the Supreme Court would ever actually rule on the moral or ethical implications of abortion either. I don't think the court has the power to do so, and if it did, there would be an uprising in this country. This conversation requires much more to be decided on before one could even tackle that question. What do I mean? Well, one would have to redefine the meaning and legal concept of the word life. It would need to encompass the point of conception in its definition. It would have to clearly lay out that a zygote has personhood deserving of moral and legal protections. Without this major concept being defined, you can't argue that abortion is murder or that abortion ends the life of a person. Another concept that would need to be defined is the point at which life has value, not just personhood. The fact that we have many legal reasons that justifies taking the life of another, self-defense, imminent dangers to society, capital punishment, shows that whatever intrinsic value one's life has is dependent on some other factor we would have to define that a zygote has intrinsic value. This isn't the same as personhood because personhood outlines the condition that an entity needs for it to be considered a person. It doesn't ascribe value to that life. Part 3. Can Roe v. Wade be overturned? It is possible for the Supreme Court to overturn a prior decision. 
According to the Supreme Court's website, when the Supreme Court rules on a constitutional issue, that judgment is virtually final. Its decisions can be altered only by the rarely used procedure of constitutional amendment or by a new ruling of the court. However, when the court interprets a statute, new legislative action can be taken. In short, yes it is. However, it's not the easiest thing to accomplish. The first one is a constitutional amendment. The last constitutional amendment was the 27th Amendment in 1992. It was originally introduced in 1789, 203 years. The second way is by a new ruling of the court. How does this work? The Supreme Court takes up a similar case and updates their interpretation of that case or they tackle another legal structure that would make the previous ruling invalid. One famous court case that was overturned was Bowers v. Hardwick. In this 1986 case, the Supreme Court upheld a Georgia anti-sodomy law that forbade oral or anal sex between consenting adults, regardless of the sexual orientation of either party. Through unusual circumstances, Michael Hardwick was seen engaging in oral sex with another man in his own bedroom by a police officer and was arrested. Although the state declined to prosecute, the American Civil Liberties Union took up the case to test the constitutionality of anti-sodomy laws, and the case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court. Homophobia clearly marked the court's decision to uphold the law. The majority declared that homosexual sodomy was traditionally considered an abominable and illegal practice, specifically ruling that the Constitution didn't provide any inherent right to practice homosexual activity. Although the law in question covered both heterosexual and homosexual sodomy, the majority made it clear that the homosexual nature of the act was the key issue. In 2003, the Supreme Court decided the case of Lawrence v. Texas by rejecting Texas's anti-sodomy law essentially declaring that the Bowers decision was incorrect. Justice Anthony Kennedy's majority opinion stated, Bowers was not correct when it was decided, and it is not correct today. It ought not to remain binding precedent. Bowers v. Hardwick should be, and now is, overruled. The dissent also specifically noted that the court was going against stare decisis by overturning Bowers. In the same way that Bowers v. Hardwick case was overturned, so could Roe v. Wade. A new interpretation of the court could find that life begins at conception, and therefore the life inside the womb is entitled to the same liberty promised in the 14th Amendment. Or the court could redefine the idea of viability in the light that, even if it does not help for it to survive, that our medical technology has evolved to even allow fetuses to live outside the womb and therefore cannot be aborted. Or a new court could take up similar cases and define personhood in a way that would grant it at conception. That abortion is not a medical procedure that falls under the 14th Amendment, that abortion isn't medically necessary to save a woman's life, that medical care should not just be between a patient and their doctor, or outright deciding the question of whether or not abortion is right or wrong. The problem with Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey is that it leaves the door open to future cases to redefine how we use and view abortion. If the state can prove its interests outweigh the mother's, then the mother has no choice in the matter. If the state can prove that it isn't causing an undue burden, they can enact whatever policies they'd like. This is how Texas has closed all but a handful of abortion clinics in the state. Abortion as a topic isn't final, and because Planned Parenthood v. Casey overturned the idea that it was a fundamental right, abortion can be heavily restricted. I will note that when I looked up Amy Barrett's position on abortion, I did find an interesting quote from her. She was quoted by NPR saying, I don't think the core case, Rose Core holding that, you know, women have a right to an abortion, I don't think that that would change. But I think the question of whether people can get very late term abortions, how many restrictions can be put on clinics, I think that would change. While this might be assuring, many people have pointed out that Trump wants to appoint someone that will overturn Roe v. Wade, so any appointee would be expected to do so. Judicial activism, anyone? Part 4. What if abortion was made illegal? 
So if Roe v. Wade was overturned and somehow we either one restricted access to abortion so much that it was practically impossible to obtain one, or two, we declared abortion to be morally and ethically wrong and thus outlawed it, what would this mean? Well, it would implicate a lot of things. One of them is women's health. According to the study, Unsafe Abortion, Unnecessary Maternal Mortality, every year worldwide, about 42 million women with unintended pregnancies choose abortion, and nearly half of those procedures, 20 million, are unsafe. Some 68,000 women die of unsafe abortions annually, making it one of the leading causes of maternal mortality, 13%. Of the women who survive unsafe abortions, 5 million will suffer long-term health complications. Unsafe abortion is thus a pressing issue. Both the primary methods for preventing unsafe abortion, less restrictive abortion laws and greater contraceptive use face social, religious, and political obstacles, particularly in developing nations where most unsafe abortions occur, 97%. Furthermore, worldwide, some 5 million women are hospitalized each year for the treatment of abortion-related complications such as hemorrhage and sepsis, and abortion-related deaths leave 220,000 children motherless. Every abortion that is performed will also need resources that could otherwise be used elsewhere, such as blood products, antibiotics, oxytoxics, anesthesia, operating rooms, and surgical specialists. The study also pointed out that abortion-related deaths are more frequent in countries with more restrictive abortion laws, 34 deaths per 100,000 childbirths, than in countries with less restrictive laws, one or fewer per 100,000 childbirths. The same correlation appears when a given country tightens or relaxes its abortion law. In Romania, for example, where abortion was available upon request until 1966, the abortion mortality ratio was 20 per 100,000 live births in 1960. New legal restrictions were imposed in 1966 and by 1989, the ratio reached 148 deaths per 100,000 live births. The restrictions were, were reversed in 1989, and within a year, the ratio dropped to 68 of 100,000 live births. By 2002, it was as low as 9 deaths per 100,000 births. Similar, similarly, in South Africa, after abortion became legal and available upon request in 1997, abortion-related infection decreased by 52%, and the abortion mortality ratio from 1998 to 2001 dropped by 91% from its 1994 level. The study also suggests that less restrictive abortion laws do not appear to entail more abortions overall. The world's lowest abortion rates are in Europe, where abortion is legal and widely available but contraceptive use is high. In Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, the rate is below 10 per 1,000 women aged 15 to 44 years. In contrast, in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, where abortion laws are the most restrictive and contraceptive use is lower, the rates range from mid-20s to 39 per 1,000 women. All in all, while abortion laws are one thing, the study also mentions that contraception use and medical education plays just as big a role in the prevention of abortions and abortion-related deaths. For areas that are extremely religious, they look down upon sex education and actively fight against contraceptive use because it would be playing God and against his wishes. This is harmful to many teenagers that get pregnant since the highest number of teen pregnancies are in the most religious states or the Bible Belt per se. By making abortion illegal, you don't stop abortions from happening. Just like gun owners say, criminals are criminals for a reason, they don't follow the law. I'm not saying people who get abortions are bad, I'm merely pointing out that they get them outside of the law. They would be criminals. These abortions would be performed in unsafe conditions and outside the scope of safe medical practice. Not only would it increase the likelihood of maternal deaths, but also inflict lifelong stigmas on these women. If they are caught getting an illegal abortion, they will then be entered into the criminal justice system. They will be shunned by society and face a social stigma for the rest of their lives. They will have to pay out of pocket for these services and the cycle of poverty will only continue for many. Not all women, women who get an abortion is some side chick to a wealthy man. 
Besides women's health, making abortion illegal would be a huge win for the culture wars within America. While the law doesn't reflect what is necessarily right and wrong, it does have an impact on the cultural outcome of society. Laws help shape and influence future behavior. Making abortion illegal is a win for the religious right and the pro-life crowd. They will see that their views are validated and that God has finally been victorious over the powers of evil. It will embolden them and could possibly lead to more intrusion of religious ideology in our secular framework. I mean, for many voters, this is the only reason they vote. They are one-issue voters. I wonder if they achieved it if they would just drop out and stop voting? Also, while I don't mean to point out the fact that abortions do save taxpayers money in the long run, it is a valid point for those who say they are fiscally responsible. Many of these women might be single mothers and live in poverty. These two things hinder, hinder one's ability to provide for themselves. They will inevitably require government assistance in the form of healthcare, living expenses, and food. Their earning potential drops as they, as they must spend more time taking care of themselves and a child. It becomes a financial strain on their families if they choose to help, not only with the monetary assistance, but also child care. It will take a community to help raise a child. However, government assistance for these mothers is being attacked constantly under the guise of welfare queens and the lazy poor. These children will not only be a product of that environment, but also continue these cycles for generations unless we intervene. One of my biggest problems comes with the fact that the state can effectively take a woman's choice when it comes to their own life. The state could rule that the risk to her life doesn't outweigh the life of the fetus. Thus, if she dies during child or during or after childbirth, the state effectively condemned her to her death. She had no choice. This would be big government having death panels. However, the right is silent in this regard for some reason thus proving that many of them hide behind small government rhetoric because they just don't agree with the policies, not because they want less influence in the government overall. If they agree with it, then it's small government. As I said before, making abortion illegal would require us to have some concrete legal definitions of philosophical ideas like personhood and why we should value human life overall. You can't argue abortion is bad because my God tells me so. This would be enforcing your religious beliefs on others and would lead to theocratical rule. If anything, we need pro-life people to make arguments based upon the idea of the doctrine of religious restraint. This should be our golden rule for policy making. I rarely hear many pro-life arguments that are based upon anything non-religious, and even when I do, they usually can't make a point beyond their feels. Or, I create some cognitive dissonance with another belief they hold, then they just quit responding. Part 5. What can we do? I don't see very many possibilities of blocking the Senate from confirming Amy Barrett. Unfortunately, controlling the People's House doesn't have power here. Amy will more than likely replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's the reality of elections. People don't really understand how elections can affect their lives and if they are generally immune to the effects of who has control, that's just privilege. Even with the election of Biden, there won't be much we can do since we don't control the Senate, and I don't see Democrats gaining power there for some time either. There are some policy suggestions that may prevent this from happening in the future. Things like adding more SCOTUS seats, limiting how many terms they can serve, opening their positions up to elections, or making them retire at a certain age. All these things do have some merits, but to be honest, it's a band-aid to some deeper problems in our system. We need to end gerrymandering. Maybe then the Senate would be more competitive and representative of each of their states. Personally, I feel that we should abolish the Senate in its current form. We replace it with a parliamentary system that, it, that represents parties and ideologies. We could have parties run national elections and then fill the seats based upon the number of votes that they get. That way, many ideologies are represented and offer a better counter to the House as a system of checks and balances. I do believe we should abolish the electoral system as well. If voting is this fundamental right and we want everyone's voice to be heard, then I don't think people in bumfuck Wyoming should have the power of seven voices in Los Angeles. These voters can't really be to blame if a city and a state's policies bring them there and that's where they want to live. 
That's the whole point of having small democratic laboratories or states, right? Why do we punish these citizens because of where they choose to live? I believe in the concept of one person, one vote, that each individual voice should be represented the same. The Electoral College just allows people who choose not to participate in society the ability to have more of a voice than those who do. If you live out in the middle of flyover country on hundreds of acres of farmland, away from civilization, then why does your voice need more power? Many citizens live in rural areas, and rural policy or urban areas, and rural policies and mindsets are not going to help fix the problems that are inherent in those areas. Another idea that I had is that we give each party four nominations to the court, and then either let the current sitting president decide or leave that final seat to be filled by a national election. This seat would be the toss-up seat. In my mind, a system like this would lead to a more balanced court. This is something we should all want. A balanced court would make sure everyone's voice is represented at this level. It's funny that justice can be ideological, but it is. There is no objective sense of justice we can point and be like, that is absolutely true. Listen, at this point, we just need to get out and vote. We need people to stop saying, well, I really don't like Biden, because Biden, as much as I don't like a lot of his policies, is not that bad of a choice right now. The way he handled himself in the first presidential debate was not this dumpster fire everybody thought it was going to be. This country can't be ran like a business anymore. We are citizens of this country, not employees. I don't want the rights of employees either. I want the rights of being an American citizen. I want the liberty and justice for all, not the few that can afford it or the ones who are in power. I want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, except I want to make sure that pursuit is obtainable for everyone. Why is it so hard to deliver these things? Well, here is to a 6-3 court. Good job, non-voters.